liberated pages from segregated spaces. What I'm talking about today is basically the space between the 1927 Freedom's Journal and the 1970 Black News or Black Typography in the 20th century. Connecting specific characteristics of Black Liberation's typographic language for a century and a half illuminates aesthetic, technical, and ideological threads that persist from abolition to Black Lives Matter. Typographic aesthetics in Black publications and activist ephemera were always designed for liberation. Black and white newspapers separately and concurrently published political news and covered societal and cultural news of interest to their divergent readers. Numerous black newspapers focused on securing African Americans' rights, opportunities, and psychological liberation. <clears throat> Continuing far into the 20th century, segregation required parallel publishing universes that made black publication and its typography and design virtually invisible to white mainstream awareness and subsequently to print history. Probably most people don't know that the first African American owned and operated newspaper in the US was Freedom's Journal, started in 1927 by free-born African Americans John Russworm and Samuel Cornish in New York City. This weekly came long before the emancipation of enslaved people and covered general news and aspects of black life not seen in white publications. Like abolitionist newspapers, it ran editorials against slavery and discrimination and provided an alternative to the rampant racism that was implicit and explicit in white publications. It also covered aspects of black life that were rarely covered elsewhere. You can see from its layout that it was the Gray Lady before the New York Times, which started in 1851 and also did not at first call out anything with bold headlines. A black newspaper had to work extra hard to establish its journalistic credentials editorially and visually. The Colored American was another black newspaper subtitled a National Negro Newspaper. The masthead included the U.S. Capitol, a globe, books, and other signifiers of patriotism and knowledge. After emancipation, Black newspapers proliferated all over the country, but mostly in northern cities. Even though they covered local events in their cities of origin, they were essentially national newspapers and were delivered by mail to black households across the U.S. On the face of it, this colored American looked like other newspapers, its content, but its content was vastly different. Generally, it reported on things left out of white mainstream newspapers that had consequences for black people. So you can see here two men of the hour, prominent black men, a leading attorney of Boston, Massachusetts, um, and another prominent person advocating for civil rights. Here's another front page of the colored American. And it looks like, you know, there's a feature story about a family, except when you look closer, it says interesting family of postmaster Frazier Baker, foully murdered at Lake City, South Carolina, February 22nd, 19, uh, 1894, I believe, 1898. Yes, that's what it says. So, you know, very often, these stories were grim. In 1981, the first edition of this story chronicling the African-American press was published. 
a history of Afro-American newspapers beginning in 1827 and continuing through to the book's publication with over 70 biographical sketches of editors and journalists, including a separate chapter dedicated to female African-American journalists and essays on the state of the black press and its relationship to the Anglo-Saxon newspapers. This 1925 issue of the California Eagle signals conformity in its eagle masthead while exposing a Ku Klux Klan attempt to arrest one of the paper's editors. The black newspapers covered the news that white mainstream papers did not. The first column headline reads, quote, Judge finds Texas cracker recounting a story of a black man who received justice after an altercation with a white man. That was pretty rare. <laughs> there were two main themes of the black press, fighting racism and finding opportunities. This issue of the California Eagle from 1925 has an article by Mary McLeod Bethune, who founded the National Council of Negro Women in 1935. Stories carried in the black or Negro or colored press rarely reach white audiences, which is a major reason why American history is so skewed and protests about teaching correct and inclusive history are rampant. Note the articles about black fraternity events and social life next to articles about the Klan and racial assaults. Covering social life was an important part of black newspapers in a segregated society. The tagline on top reads, quote, if you fail to read the California Eagle, you may never know it happened. Traditional images with eagles show patriotism and a certain kind of conservatism and desire for belonging and equal treatment. The widely disseminated double V symbol stood for victory at war over enemies, quote, from without and victory at home against the enemy of prejudice, quote, from within. African-American soldiers who fought in World War II were still subject to rampant discrimination and Jim Crow laws upon their return. J. Edgar Hoover, then head of the FBI, tried to shut down this campaign by charging the Chicago Defender's editor with an act of sedition, but the Attorney General intervened after appeals from prominent black journalists. Keep in mind how hard it has been to charge January 6th conspirators with seditious conspiracy despite videotapes and a long trail of planning documents. J. Edgar Hoover, whose corrupt FBI would have far more success decades later in subverting the Black Panther Party, thought it was seditious to demand rights for returning black soldiers. Dr. Jesse Erickson, a former University of Delaware library special collection scholar and English professor who is now at the Morgan Library in New York, has written extensively about early black print culture and history. He points out that black publications, especially after the Harlem Renaissance in the early part of the 20th century, included aspects of communication that were part of African communication traditions. You can see in these 1918 issues of The Crisis, the magazine of the NAACP founded by W.E.B. Du Bois in 1910, examples of integrating the text and the image by creating them with the same tools and in the same style. Later, the crisis used more conventional typography, although it remained connected to the image aesthetics. The 1927 cover on the left is by Aaron Douglas. The one on the right is from February 1930 by Raymond E. Jackson. This 1928 book cover by Aaron Douglas puts the image and text into a symbiotic relationship to communicate the atmosphere he is trying to convey. It includes the musicality that Jesse Erickson pointed out with moving text 
and actual musical notes. The point was to make the words seem audible and animated in print. Marshall McLuhan, in his Theory of Media and Medium, lamented the loss of aural, listening and speaking, traditions passed down from person to person without being written down. He oversimplified so-called, quote, tribal man in a patronizing way, but he was actually on to something. He pointed out that information belonged to those who could print and read. Black publications started to bring back these traditions like call and response, shouting, repetition, and musicality through typography. It is obvious in this 1967 early issue of the Black Panther newspaper, set in typewriter type, that Emory Douglas was not interested in emulating the traditions of establishment newspapers. Like so many issues of the Black Panther paper, the cover shouted a loud demand. Here are three other papers. Free the New York 21, Political Prisoners of USA Fascism, Free Angela. Black newspapers thrived and proliferated in the US before television news took over. Small press publications like the Black News from New York told more stories that were not covered in the mainstream press. This masthead takes a hard turn from the classic respectability of earlier black newspapers with a fluid masthead and illustrations that attempted to show the truth of conditions in black communities. The artist here is Setu Dyson. The Black Panther newspaper the news service of the Black Panther Party, which had a different readership than traditional big city black newspapers from Detroit, New York, and Pittsburgh, aspired to a multiracial and international audience for global liberation. In 1967, the masthead went through many different iterations, moving toward a bolder and more condensed typographic representation with bold rules to match the bold type. Keep in mind that Emory Douglas and others used pressed down letters, rules, and patterned background sheets to create their look. They used format brand rubbed down materials because they said Letra set was too expensive. Emory Douglas used this familiar type of layout most often, um, that was most often used to promote musical shows to advertise a Panther event, which happened to have music by the Grateful Dead. This is a page from the Black Panther newspaper. And um, since it was a tabloid, it was expected that many of the pages would end up being put up as posters. Emory said they would have other acts perform early in the evening while the elders and children were there. Then later the dead would play and the dead heads would show up and smoke weed, etc. They wanted to protect the vulnerable members of the community. Emory's poster has the familiarity of vernacular posters for concerts put up in black neighborhoods. The typography is kind of all over the place, requiring you to, leave, to read it thoroughly to find out exactly who, what, when, where, etc. And I think that this is a part of a continuing oral tradition, that everything isn't laid out in a straightforward way in columns. You know, you have to kind of figure out <laughs> what's going on. Here, a similar all over design is used on the front page of the Black Panther paper using small panther icons instead of stars. Perhaps Douglas was moving the paper away from the staid typographic conventions people expected from a newspaper. While the Black Panther paper used street style in its music posters, there was a parallel movement of Art Nouveau inspired psychedelic art and type. Jesse Erickson, the scholar I mentioned earlier, uh, contends that hip hop and graffiti, etc., grew out of this, these early black typography um, 
traditions that combined image and text and used a lot of hand lettering. This is the 1971 cover of the BP paper about Melvin Van Peebles' film, Sweet Sweetback. This issue contained a long essay by Huey Newton explaining the film's significance, especially to rank and file Black Panther Party members. The film, made on a shoestring budget, included sex scenes so they would not have to use union crew in making the film. It was about a black man fighting back and eluding police after being wrongfully accused of a crime. This frame is from the last scene where the protagonist escapes. Even though Emery did not design the original type for the film, he made the words shout with a simple rearrangement. Party members were encouraged to see the film and the word of mouth made it a small hit. Here are two other iterations of the title, but as you can see, Emery used contrast, size, and color to make a statement. Most people don't know that the Black Panther paper usually printed color on the inside spread as well as on the front and the back. On the right, you see Sweetback in his long, on his long run through the field, superimposed over Huey Newton's essay that reiterated the story's significance to all black people fighting for freedom. Here's another inside spread of a Black Panther newspaper with uncharacteristic white space and a superimposed illustration by Emery. This treatment echoes the Harlem Renaissance image text combinations with the same effect, making the text come alive on the page. Another vertically oriented middle spread reused Emery's cover artwork from Bobby Seale's Chicago trial and included a photograph of the chair he was strapped to in the courtroom. So you can see the prison bars um, behind the type. Another example of cross-cultural cooperation that the Black Panthers had with other groups. An article on the MoMA website pointed out that the Black Panthers shared pages of several 1969 issues with Basta Ya, a newspaper published by Los Siete de la Raza, a group fighting for Latinx rights in San Francisco. The visual language of protest, figurative, a combination of photos and drawings with strong messages and bold block text allowed for stylistic solidarity among the many different groups fighting for equality across the U.S. and the world. Douglas was a critical voice in developing that language in ways that spoke to his own black community and continues to influence artists to the present day. Los Siete de la Raza, the seven of the Hispanic community, was the label given to seven young Latinos from the Mission District of San Francisco who were involved in a 1969 altercation with police that left one officer dead. The incident and subsequent trial became a cause celeb of the Latin American community and the new left. All seven were acquitted, similar to Bobby Seale's ordeal with the Chicago Seven and Huey Newton's fight for justice. All of these newspapers, and many more like them, did the work of informing and celebrating African Americans in the most hostile of social conditions. The Black Panther and later newspapers built off these models, intending to influence and mobilize for freedom and liberation. As we know from so many things happening in our country, including the January 6th investigation going on right now. There is still work that needs to be done. Thank you.